Today is the 30th of July, uh, 2013. We're at the New York State Military Museum in Saratoga Springs, New York. My name is Wayne Clark. Sir, for the record, would you please state your full name? Joseph, Date, place of birth, please. Joseph Patrick Jackson, uh, 6 June 48, uh, excuse me, June 30th, 1948, New Haven, Connecticut. Grew up mostly in Brooklyn and Vermont, New York. All right, and did you attend school in Brooklyn? Mary Queen of Heaven for just kindergarten and uh, about a month of first grade. Mm -hmm. The rest of it was Holy Trinity in Mermaronic and Stepanek High School in White Plains. Did you graduate from high school? Oh, yes. And did you go on to college? or? I went for a year to Pace College Westchester in Pleasantville. Mm -hmm. uh, it's now Pace University. Uh, I didn't do so well there for whatever reasons, and I, it was after that I joined the Marines. After the Marines, I went back to Westchester Community College, graduated with an AA and an AS degrees, uh, social sciences and math, okay. and earth science from Brockport uh, in uh, 1973. It's in August 1973, I graduated from Brockport State. Now, why did you go into the Marine Corps? Uh, the, you know, the, the obvious thing that I would, would claim, say is patriotism, but beyond that, uh, I, a girl had just dropped me uh, before my exams in Pace College, and I was kind of uh, low at the time, so mm -hmm. that was part of it. Plus, I was, did not have a happy home life. Uh, so there was several reasons. Uh, the patriotism was was something that was bothering me that mm -hmm. there was a war going on and I wasn't in it. And where did you go for your basic training? Uh, Paris Island. I went in at Whitehall mm -hmm. down in Manhattan and they trained us down to Paris Island, uh, South Carolina. And when did you go in? I went on in on June 30th, 1967, which happened to be my 19th birthday. Mm -hmm. I was offered two or four. Two, I had to go then. Four, I wanted to go at the end of the summer. And they said, uh, if you go at the end of the summer, it's for four years. If you go for two years, you, can, uh, you go June 30th. And so I went June 30th. For two years? For two years. I was a two-year enlistee. A rare breed. I was going to say that's pretty unusual, isn't it? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, people always thought I was a draftee. I had to prove it in my records that I was, I believe, uh, type N instead of J. J being a draftee. Hmm. And was that your first time away from home for for a long period? I had been to camps and stuff for you know camps for like two three weeks in the summer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what was basic training like for you? <laughs> uh, hot, a lot of screaming and yelling. Um, we had a rather brutal senior drill instructor. Uh, his name was Dale Clark. Um, he was rather brutal. Uh, he used privates to beat up other privates. Um, boot camp was not a lot of fun. I, I, I can't recommend boot camp to anybody. <laughs> and once you graduated from boot camp, did you go on, go on to an advanced school? Yeah, I, I went to basic, as soon as you finish boot camp, you went to basic infantry in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. It used to be called New River, North Carolina. Um, from there, uh, that was just basic infantry. Uh, How long was that school? That was a month. A month. It was 10 weeks of basic in the same platoon, platoon 1000 in boot camp, and then uh, I believe it was F Company uh, for a regiment, training regiment for, uh, uh, for um, Camp Lejeune. Uh, there was no break. They bust you right from boot camp to basic infantry. I kind of enjoyed basic infantry. Infantrymen who went on stayed there and went to advanced infantry training, AIT. I instead was sent home on leave for uh, 20 days plus travel, and then I had orders to uh, California Camp Pendleton uh, to go to Artillery Forward Observer School or Artillery Scout Observer School for a month there. And what was that like? 
Oh, that was a lot of fun. A lot of map reading. You got to call artillery shells in. You, mm -hmm. I mean, I already knew about the map reading and the what uh, and uh, using compass and land navigation kind of stuff. So I was pretty much at home. I had a pretty good time at it. What was new was the use of the military grids that they use system for calling artillery. That was new to me. I did quite well at it. Um, when they came up for your final exam, I was told to hit a specific 55-gallon drum out there, and out there in the valley down below, and I hit it with my first shot right on, hit the barrel. Mm -hmm. Now, now, what what were you using to uh, to shoot? Well, we 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 had a radio and a map and a compass, and you'd okay. pick out pick out your coordinates and so, your direction. So they, they lobbed a, an artillery round of a 105 millimeter okay. howitzer was doing the firing force. Okay. We had um, also uh, had uh, been there for, uh, where they were using um, four deuce mortar shells uh, earlier. This is earlier they had used four deuce mortar shells. Uh, at the artillery range uh, at Camp Pendleton, but this was the final, and they were using a 105. Okay. And once you completed that uh, training, did they send you back home on leave, or did you go right to Vietnam? Well, no. For a couple of weeks, they stuck us there, and nobody was going in at any place. And the class in front of us had been there for a month doing nothing. And uh, they were just putting the guys in a working party. And uh, the guys rebelled, and there were 18 guys in the class. And um, the one day I had a, a, a medical appointment that I had been waiting for was the day that these guys chose to refuse to go to work. <laughs> so I show back the next day, and I told them to include me in on it. And um, the next day, some lieutenants got him us all standing up there, and he tells the 18 of us to take a step forward. And I step forward, and the lieutenant says, not you, you weren't part of this mutiny that was going on. And then I started explaining to him what they wanted was orders to go someplace. They, they said, tell us you're going to send us to our units, whether it be in Vietnam or anywhere. And the guys would go right back to work. Why have a mutiny? The guys want to go. He, he, the guys want to go, send them. And so he thought it over for a while, and then instead of marching the guys off to the brig, he uh, saw that we got orders, and he, what he did was he promised, okay, you guys, you guys go back to work, and I'll see what I can do. And they decided to ship us all out. And these guys got shipped to the 2nd Marine Division, like I did. Guys that on the West Coast got shipped to the 5th Marine Division in Pendleton, which meant they didn't go anywhere. But they were in there, they were in units. Shortly after we got to those units, we then got, within a month, I had orders to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, and most of the guys did. Now, did you go over as an entire unit? Oh, no. No, I was, I was now part of the 2nd Marine Division, mm -hmm. India 310, at Camp Lejeune. Four weeks after I got there, after Christmas, they were supposed to leave on a med cruise, and I was going with them. And they told us, you know, that we're going on a med cruise, and I would not have had time to go to Vietnam after they came back. So it meant I wasn't going to Vietnam. So I go, okay, I'm not going to Vietnam. I'm going to the Mediterranean. Day be hours before these guys were going to get ready to leave, I got orders to Vietnam. I got another leave. They sent me back home and then back out to Camp Pendleton. I went to a place they called Station Battalion out in Camp Pendleton. And uh, this was uh, more infantry training, mm -hmm. uh, trying to get us in shape for, for it was uh, trying to get us in shape for Vietnam. And uh, uh, again, that was kind of fun, the, uh, the infantry training that they went through. But during that time, they pulled me and somebody else, and I guess they were pulling them from other staging companies, and they brought me in and sat me down and said, um, they're going to send, send me to language school. And they then 
proceeded to tell me that I was one of two selected to go to the Marine Language School for one month or three months to the Army School up at Monterey. And I suddenly realized that this captain didn't have the right to order me to go to the, the school. I had to accept it. And I said, okay, I'd rather go to the three-month Army School. I'd already had, had, had my taste of the Marines. And he says, no, no, you're going to go to the thing. I said, no, I don't want to go. And so you're going to do that and send me to Vietnam. And he says, well, we're going to send you to Vietnam right now. And I said, all right. You know, I said, one way or the other, I'm going to end up there. So he relented and sent me to the three months of the Army School, uh -huh. at, uh, which was you know, like Boy Scout camp uh, compared to the rest of the Marines, and the food was better and everything else. And um, now, were there other Marines there? Uh -huh. Oh yeah, there was a mixture. Uh, they, when you went to Station Battalion, that was not your final unit either. You were going to be transferred into companies in in Vietnam that were already existing. You were going to be replacements, and uh, so with. Oh, well, I don't know, 100 guys, I don't remember how many were in the, the language school. They had, you went there for three months and then went to Vietnam, and that's pretty much. There were also guys, Marines that were there for a year studying Vietnamese, studying Russian, studying all kinds of language. They were in another barracks, the guys that were more permanent than us. Mm -hmm. The uh, bunch of... Now, were you supposed to be like an interpreter? Is that why they said Yeah, they... Yeah, uh, it was, it was going to be like a low-level interpreter. You don't have enough time in, in Vietnamese language class to learn it well enough mm -hmm. to, to really be an interpreter. Um, but anyway, so they sent me to the language school, and it happened to be that I was supposed to arrive in Vietnam on 22nd of February, 1968, which was the day after the Tet Offensive uh, stood up. And probably the hardest three months that they had in Vietnam were the three months I was in Monterey. So I missed it mm. by chance. Um, I went over there and I did talk myself on a one foot patrol. There was, uh, and they were talking to civilians and I talked my way onto it because I had been in language school. Well, problem was, while I could get the civilians to understand me, I couldn't understand what they were saying back. I'd say something in Vietnamese and they'd go, oh, blah, 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 and I'm looking at them, what are they? <laughs> no clue, because they would just act as if I was a native speaker and yeah. I, I couldn't follow what they were saying. But they always understood me. Hmm. So I spent three months of the Marines' time and a lot of money learning something that I couldn't use in Vietnam. I did get called once uh, by a captain who I didn't like very much to interpret for him with a Vietnamese officer. The officer wanted our, our can powder, gunpowder canisters, they are metal canisters mm -hmm. that they used for the 155s. He wanted to use them to make bunkers, which they do do. And he was trying to ask the, the cap, our captain and he couldn't seem to make him understand what he was after. So I got called over there and I listened to him and of course he didn't have a word of English. And I, I said, he, he's after the canisters. He wants them to make, to make bunkers out of them. And I'm thinking, okay, we've got these canisters all the time. Sure, why not give them the canisters? Well, Captain, not being a nice guy, said no. And he's not being very polite about it. And so he says, tell him I said, tell him I said no. So I say, Dai we noi on kong ka, which means the captain says you can't have. I think it was seven words. It's the only Vietnamese I spoke officially in Vietnam after three months of training. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> So after stage battalion, I went to language school. From language school, they uh, uh, took us to Travis Air Force Base, flew us up to Anchorage. I burned a hole in my pants 
like this big. I fell asleep. I fell asleep on the uh, what it, on a on a on the bus with a uh, cigarette in my lap, and it burned a hole in my pants up high on my thigh. So I had to sit all the way through the Anchorage airport and everything. I had to carry my my service record book in front of me because my leg was exposed oh. there. <laughs> I'm in a public airport in Anchorage for. I think it was nine hours with the service record book hiding the hole in my pants. All right, so uh, you ended up uh, from there. Did you fly to Japan and then to Vietnam? or We stopped, I think, in Okinawa. No, I, I mean, we did stop in Okinawa. We, I may, we may have landed in Guam first. I know I was in Guam. I can't remember coming and going which, when I landed in Guam, but it, mm -hmm. all the flights in, I landed in, in Okinawa, and we were there for a while, and they um, took half of our, our, they took our uniforms, and, and they gave us a second sea bag, and we had to put all our dress uniforms in the one bag, and then they stored it for the year that we were in Vietnam. Um, they didn't give us jungle clothes, I went over there with the, I didn't get them till later. Um, now, it, now, whereabouts did you land in Vietnam? Oh, Da Nang. We flew in a Continental, 70, Continental Airlines 707, mm -hmm. with, complete with stewardesses. And uh, they told us that the airstrip was under fire, that when we, they, they stopped the thing and they opened the gate, we were to hush rush the hell out of the plane and get into a bunker as fast as we could. And the guy took the plane and he stood it on its wing and he corkscrewed in there. And I mean, we were like really tipped over and he's corkscrewing in there. So our imagination is going pretty good. We get down there and we land, right? And he jams on the, the brakes and everything. So we're really all ready to get off the hell off this plane. We think we're in combat already. None of us got any weapons. And then the taxi taxied around the airport for about 15, 20 minutes, just taxi around the airport, you know, and that was it, you know, they didn't, nothing happened, you know, there was no incoming mortar shells or rockets or anything like that, we just mm -hmm. taxied around. Then they opened the door up and it was like the corny glass works. It was what, May 26, 68? It was a, uh, a year later, two weeks, two weeks after that, it would have been June 11th, it was 138 degrees when I left. So I can't imagine what it was, but it must have been in a, well in the 120s when we landed in May. And it was like walking into a blast furnace. Mm -hmm. Nothing could have prepared you for it. Okay, so you landed in Da Nang and you went right, right to your unit or? Oh no. <laughs> there I am. I'm scared. I've got no rifle. I can't shoot back. I don't know where anything is. They took, after hanging around for a good part of the day, they took us over, took me and a few, a few others over to uh, 11 Marine Regiment, which is the artillery unit, which is, would be my home unit. And I'm sitting there for four days with no helmet, no rifle, no flat jacket, no nothing. Mm -hmm. And... Um, the first day there, I decided to take a trip to the head. I'm walking down in this road, which is like a two wheel tracks with a grass hump in the middle. I'm walking through this little bamboo grove of trees and I almost stepped on a snake. Something like this, it looked kind of whitish green and it's up there looking at me and I got my foot over it. Right? I'm looking down at it and I'm absolutely terrified of snakes. I have not been looking forward to snakes. Here's my first day, I got a snake under my foot. He's looking up at me, I'm looking down at him, trying to freeze. Well, after a while, you're, you're standing on one foot, my right foot is going like this. I could see in his face that he was getting ready to strike the inside of my ankle. So I moved the foot just a little bit, and he struck the bottom of it, come back up out of it, and I'm looking at him, he's got this really, what the heck was that, day's look. He kind of shook himself up a little bit, and then he looked up at me, turned and ran. Then I turned and ran. <laughs> <laughs> Day one, um, I was speaking Vietnamese with the civilians that were working there on the base. 
We won't go into the details of that because what I got offered for what they were selling, uh, I don't want to put into the thing. Uh, I spent four days. They tried to put me in guard duty my first night. And I said, is there a machine gun up there? And he says, yeah. I says, well, good, because I don't have a rifle. <laughs> I didn't have to go to guard duty. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Looking for somebody for guard duty, somebody with a weapon pro preferably. And they didn't throw you on KP then, did they? Well, for, for four days, they just hung around, did nothing there. Yeah. Eventually, I got to battalion up at 213. Uh, they uh, gave me rifle, and I got boots, and I don't know what else. Uh, I got a bunch of stuff, and they put me in the back of the truck to take me down to the 27th Marine Regiment paymaster. So we come out of the base, and we're on this road, and... We're coming past a, a corner I later knew was four corners. And one corner of it was a skivvy house district. I didn't know this. We're coming along and I got my rifle and I'm like bouncing around, you know, on the back of the thing and I'm hanging on, right? And I see this Vietnamese guy come out. He's got the cone hat on, he's got black pajamas on, and he's got a rifle. And he just steps out of the, out of the trees. So I'm coming up to shoot him. And I'm squeezing the trigger, and yeah, you know, mind, mind you, I'm going by him on the truck. I'm squeezing the trigger, and this marine pops out of the trees and starts talking to him. He was a popular force guy. Oh. <laughs> so the first day, first day with a rifle, my fourth day in country, I almost shot a, a friendly. <laughs> Made me trigger slow ever afterwards. I was afraid of shooting somebody I shouldn't after that. Uh -huh. He doesn't know how close he came. I mean. I was, I, I was, I had him sighted in, I was just going to, and there's this guy pops out of a tree next to him, out of the trees, and that was it. Hmm. Okay, so what happened next? Well, I went down to Paymaster, it took me back to 213. I was turned over to a, the battalion XO, a major, I uh, can't remember his name, Dunheim or something, Dunhamer. I can't remember his name, but uh, he was a really nice guy. And he was the battalion executive officer. And I didn't have anything to do. I didn't, I wasn't doing anything all during the day for, for quite a while. I'd go over to him and I asked him if he could send me out with, you know, and nothing happened. And then uh, after about a couple of weeks of doing nothing, they, um, he comes and gets me and tells me that I'm going out with a recon squad. No, that's not later. He tells me I'm going down at, Echo Battery uh, 213, and so I went down there and worked on a gun crew for a for a month for four weeks from the end end of June into somewhere's in July, but it was four weeks in, uh, on a 105 crew working as a loader. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of little stories in there, and I'm not going to go into this one great big tale of a battle, and I've got it down on 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 electronically. Uh, probably in an email that you've gotten. Um, I come back, the guys keep telling me they're going home, and I keep laughing at them because they're not going home. And the 27th of the July rolls by, and they're telling me they're going home, and, I'm, and it goes into August. Uh, I went out for a stroll with a, a squad looking for an MIA, and he's still MIA um, from a Delta 213. And um, it's a long story in itself. I've provided information for him of a possible gravesite about 10 years ago, and nothing has come of it since then. He's still MIA. Uh, so I come back after that one foot patrol, my first one, and uh, they put me in mess duty for a week. Four days into mess duty, they come pull me off. They're sending me out with the recon squad. Uh, along with a second lieutenant, an old guy who was a Mustanger, and he, the four of us are in the, him and me, uh, we join up with this recon squad and they chop us out uh, about 35 miles south to a mountaintop where we sat for two weeks. And then after about a week we're there, the unit announces they're going home without us. And, uh, you know, I was ready to walk out of there back to get my stuff uh, was all, when we finally did get back a week later, our, the whole part of the camp was empty, my gear was gone, mm. 
They took us to regiment. He took took me down a regiment. He got orders home. I got transferred to uh, Lima 411, and uh, I ended up on a gun crew there because they didn't have any forward observers in the field. And uh, I, I spent uh, a month on one of on the 155 howitzer, the M109. It's a great big thing. It looks like a tank. Mm -hmm. um, there's a picture of it there. With, Gun named Flower Power. Well, I was going to say, you want to just hold that up in front of you and I can, I can zoom in on it. Okay, got it. Okay. Um, how it came about was, is, um, I talked it over with the gun crew and we decided to name the gun Flower Power. And I had my sister mail us some daisy decals, you know, flower things. Mm -hmm. So we put them on the side of the gun. And it was a joke, you know, flower power. Sure. This is, this is, <laughs> this is power. It may not, I know that there's at least one other cannon that was named flower power, and there are probably lots of them. Uh, well, somebody got wind of it, and the next thing I know, they called the, uh, gun sergeant, uh, Sergeant Collette, into the uh, office, and he comes back and he gets me. And I've got to go up there, and I had to explain to him that it was a joke, that no, this wasn't an anti-war statement, you know, they're down making in the Marines by saying flower power. Well, they made us take off the decals, but in exchange, they said, just to be regulation, you can stencil the name on the gun, and that's what you see in the photo is flower power. As soon as we did that, the other five gun crews decided they wanted to name their guns. I don't remember them all. I just remember the the Hispanic crew, which was Cubans and uh, Cuban Americans and Mexican Americans, uh, were a majority. They named that the Tijuana Taxi. Later than that, a gun crew that was a uh, 155 towed crew that was assigned it with to Lima for a while. I know that they went down to Liberty Bridge where I had been for a while. Mm -hmm. And when they went there, they named their 155 Toad Howitzer Flower Power. And I had seen a picture of it with the name Flower Power on it. So the name spread. And uh, they may, I may not have been the first one, but I was the first one of those two guns. Mm -hmm. I, now, were you um, ever under fire? Rock, rocket oh, attacks yeah. or mortars? And oh, yeah. Um, Pretty constant? No. No, I, I must have gone month, three months without hearing a shot, uh, any kind of shot, uh, other than the cannons going off. Uh, you know, nothing nothing coming at me. Mm -hmm. um, when I first got there at headquarters, some idiots went out into outside the base on a patrol. They got down the bottom of a gully, started shooting tracer bolts over the top of the hill, so they were going like 100 feet in the air over the top of the hill. The whole base turned out and everybody shooting. Of course, nobody could shoot down in the valley where the gully where they were. And, but that was nothing. It wasn't even a battle. Uh, the first time I went under fire was at, uh, with Echo Battery. I was uh, in a, a top bunk. There was a bunk and, and a double de deck bunker. I don't know how to say it. It's a bunker and it had bunks, mm -hmm. double deck bunks. And um, that night, uh, Sergeant Estes, the gun sergeant up there, was sleeping on top of the sandbags on the roof because it was cool. Well, we heard a machine gun chattering, but we weren't paying any attention to it. All of a sudden, somebody yells, Sergeant Estes, get off the top of the bunker. Tracers, he's asleep in the bunk. Tracers are going over the top of him. <laughs> I rolled out and hit the guy down below me who wasn't too pleased with me. But um, by the time it scrambled out of there, there was no battle left going on anymore. The traces had stopped coming over us. Um, that would have been in, in June. Uh, July 4th, we fought a major engagement, which uh, for us, um, and it's a long story uh, that I'm not gonna be able to put in, uh, that other than electronically or on paper. Uh, it's too long to tell here. Now, um, were you under like a ground attack or? 
Yeah. They tried to rush the gate at sundown and mm -hmm. um, they killed a couple of the trucks. They had a couple of trucks that were parked in the gate. One of them, they, not all the trucks could get into the base right away at that point. They hadn't gotten them all in. And so the NVA tried to rush it and uh, they killed uh, three truckers. Uh, we were at right angles to the, uh, to the gate. Um, and it, it, it's, it's a long story, but the, in the morning they said we had killed two dozen with a cannon. Wow. Now, did your units suffer any casualties? We, we lost the three, besides them? the three truckers. No, okay. no, most of the fighting was at the gate, uh, but we were doing the killing with the cannon. Mm -hmm. We had a 105 that we just clobbered them with it, and mm -hmm. uh, I was very much part of that that I was on a gun crew, a different gun crew, but I organized it and was directing the fire as an FO. Uh, and we just clobbered them off from the side there. We fired over 150 rounds. Now, did you receive a, a commendation for that? As I said, it's a long story with that. Captain Reed, who was well hated in that, in that unit, um, there were good officers and bad. Reed was the, the CEO of Echo Battery. I don't know, about five minutes into the battle, and it's well organized, and I got everything going, and everybody's happy, right? And we're all shooting the rifles and everything else. He comes over there, raising with his 45 up in the air, and he's screaming at the top of his lungs, and nobody can understand a word he said. Nobody. I mean, for me to talk to the gun crew chief, I had to get up right next to him and speak to him. Here's this guy, and it's like Teddy Roosevelt going up San Juan Hill. And he actually was scaring me and the other guys with the way he was waving that 45 in the air. Well, nobody was paying any attention to him other than the fact that they were afraid of him. Mm -hmm. I had to go calm him down. Um, he, I had been trying, I had expected to go out with the infantry as a forward observer, and so, Work on a gun crew was not something I wanted to do. When I got up to Da Nang at headquarters battery for on a road trip after this battle, I went over to see my major and tell him, uh, you know, that well, that I still wanted to go out with the with the grunts. And he starts to, and he starts asking me about the battle. And he said Captain Reed has put himself in for a bronze star. And I look at him, and I got a trucker standing there with me from the battery. And I started to laugh right in the major's face, and I, I you know, I said, I, I told him about the ca captain. I told him that it was me leading the gun crews, directing the fire, and everything else. And I said, it wasn't worth a bronze star on my part. I mean, most of the rifle fire that came in was at the gate. Mm -hmm. By the time I'm directing the fire, our rifles had pretty much suppressed the enemy fire. I was not great enough danger to get a bronze star myself. Mm -hmm. Combination, maybe. Bronze Star, and he put himself in for it, and this is a guy who was not leading the troops. Did he get it? No. <laughs> <laughs> I can promise you that. I can promise you that. I went back, the, the Major tells me, okay, I'll see what I can do, and he tells me, go back to the unit, all right, and I'll send for you. Now, what rank were you at? I was point? a Lance Corporal. Okay. And he says, he'll send for me. So I go back down to the unit, and, um, one of the guys from fire control comes up to me and he says, they got a radio message ordering me back to Da Nang. I'm supposed to come back the next day to go out with the next thing. Come the morning, I'm expecting to get called and told them to get on board a truck and go to Da Nang. Nothing happens. Second day, that evening, they tell me that the major himself got on the on the uh, wire with this guy, on the radio with this guy, and told him directly to send me back, right? Nothing happens. Third day, a written order for my return came down from battalion ordering the captain to return me. Um, so in the morning, I'm ordered onto a truck, 
And all these guys turn out and they're yelling and cheering and waving and everything else. And I said, what the hell's going on? He says, they were all so pleased with me. I had gotten the better of the captain. <laughs> <laughs> this unit had no morale except one thing. They all hated that captain. Hmm. <laughs> they had all heard about the whole story. They heard about it from the Motor T guy. They knew that I had screwed the captain out of his Bronze Star. And they also know that the Major was pissed as hell at him. So that was the end of my days with Echo Battery. Okay. Um, then where'd you go next? Uh, well, I went back up to headquarters battery mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I went out on that foot patrol I mentioned with the MIA and then I went out, uh, went on mess duty for four days and cut it off after the fourth day and sent me out with the recons. Then the unit went home, I went to Lima battery. Um, there was no action up on the, when I was out with the recons. They, uh, the only thing that happened up there was we had a short round that nearly blew the hell out of us. It was supposed to go 600 meters past us, it landed 600 meters short. The only thing else that happened up there was, well, there was the dog, they had a dog, it bit its handler. From then on, for the rest of the two weeks, the guy spent the whole time at the other end of the base away from everybody else. They wouldn't let the dog near anybody. And um, they gassed themselves. Uh, one of the uh, recons took a CS grenade, threw it upwind. We were used to throwing grenades over the cliff, down below us, and out into the into the rocks at night with no warning. All right, mm -hmm. because this was an awfully lonely spot we were on. But to throw a CS grenade upwind, <laughs> they gassed everybody on the damn hill. Hmm. Yeah, the other thing notable up there was uh, when we finally got a resupply, they come in with a sea night, and you can't land on a hill. To get onto it, you had to jump from the bed of the sea, of the sea night, a chopper, onto the, onto the cliff. There's a gap of, you know, like anywhere from a foot and a half to two feet. I mean, and trying to jump that far with a load of gear was pretty hard. Well, we did it, and the squad that was before us left. But when we got the resupply, they're handing out water jerry cans to us, right? Mm -hmm. Well, a gust of wind took that chopper, and it was all of a sudden, the chopper's going down the hill sideways like this. And it damn near went, turned, it damn near turned all the way over, you know, where it was vertical. It was close to being vertical, going away from the cliff, he managed to recover it, bring it back, and give us our water. But, um, oh, that was scary seeing that chopper go off sideways off that mountaintop because, I mean, all he had to do was catch part of it, catch catch part of the rock on the mm -hmm. side of that cliff, and he was done. You know. Now, what did you have for food? Just sea rations, mostly? On With the recons, yeah. We were we started out with K-Rats, and we, we used up all our water. Um, we ran out of K-Rats. Uh, we stopped eating K-Rats because it was, it was using up our water. We didn't have enough water to, to stay up there. And it was a couple, I don't know, like a day and a half or two days or something where we didn't have any sea rations or, or water. The uh, guys, I missed five meals. And the reason, the, what happened was after we ran out of the sea rations, and couldn't use the, the K rations and the long rats, not K rations, long rats. The guys were going out to the barbed wire and bringing back the ham and lima beans, which had a name, they were called ham and something else. You know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. All right, Dad, it was not a very nice name. Nobody wanted to eat the ham and lima right. beans. The guys were actually going out there and eat, bringing back the ham and lima beans. They offered me some. I refused to eat for five meals. I would not touch those lima beans for all the tea in China. Um, it was pretty hot up there, it was pretty dusty. Um, the guys started laughing at me after a while. I started taking dust baths like a bird. They all stunk to high heaven. You sit two weeks on a mountaintop in the sun. Mm -hmm. um, not much happened to us up there other than these little quaint little stories. Mm -hmm. Now what about mail call? Did you get much mail at all? 
<laughs> Remember now, 213 went home while I was out in the bush with the recons. I eventually ended up in Lima 411. After a while, I started getting letters that had been sent to me in head, in, in, at, at headquarters 213. And um, they had apparently sent my, my mail f f for a period of time to every damn Marine unit in Vietnam, including the 3rd Marine Division. They had all these units marked on this mail that this mail had been to looking for me. Uh, the last couple of letters I got were in December, like three months later, after I had left, <clears throat> after I had left 213, I was still getting mail from August, mm -hmm. and the, the mail had MIA with a big question mark next to my name. <laughs> they couldn't find me. Now, um, d did you uh, get an R&R &R while you were over there? Yeah, I went to R&R &R over New Year's, which was a mistake. Uh, New Year's 68, 69. I went to Hawaii. Uh, it was a mistake. And the reason it was a mistake was fireworks are legal and were being used quite a lot New Year's Eve. And it had me shaken. I mean, it bothered me more than somebody shooting at me. It, you know, by that time, I was didn't mind being shot at so much. But those fireworks, it was just so much of it. It mm -hmm. just unnerved me, I gotta admit, that I was very unhappy there and won the New Year's Eve. And uh, you mentioned uh, almost going out on a, on a helicopter as a door gunner. Oh yeah, that's much later in Charlie Battery. Uh, there was a number of incidences the first captain we had in Lima Battery was Captain Chavez, and he was a good guy, well respected. He was replaced after about a month or so by uh, Captain Clifford G. Blasey, who became well known as Captain Blasey, sir. And I had actually done that to his face. Captain Blasey, sir, put on my best southern accent, sir. Yes, sir, Captain Blasey, sir. Uh, Blasey was 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 a coward. Uh, Reed was not a coward. He turned out he just wasn't very good. Uh, Blasey was the one ca coward officer I came across in Vietnam, and um, he uh, we had more than a few exchange of words. And uh, I found a clause that said that I could call him Captain or Sir as long as I call him by his rank. I didn't have to say Sir. We went through that, and uh, there was an incident where he proved his cowardice in, uh, I believe it was March 19, 1969, was the night of that non-battle. I call it the Battle of the Barbed Wire, and it's a long story. But um, afterwards, I called him a coward in the morning and got away with it. He couldn't, he wanted to bring me up in insubordination charges, and I said, you're gonna look real good when I accuse you of cowardice and dereliction of duty in front of the non-enemy, because we'd shot up the barbed wire the night before. So I wanted to mask a battalion, he wouldn't grant it. And I managed to get myself on a run and I diverted it to battalion and I talked to the major up there at 411 and told him what had happened and told him I wanted to transfer. Uh, I cited the first sergeant, John De Jack or John Deboy, uh, as a witness. Next thing I know, within a few days, first sergeant Deboy's is being transferred. To 111, which is in the same headquarters as where Lima 4, where headquarters 411 is, headquarters 111 is in the same base. And the day after that, I got transferred to Charlie 111. So I go up there and I report to him at 111. And um, I ended up as a tower FO for the last 10, 12 weeks. Uh, looking for rockets uh, mm -hmm. at uh, the 1st Marine Regiment CP, uh, about eight miles south of the ammo dump uh, there. Um, what was I saying about the, oh, well, the helicopters? There was a major battle there, I think it was May 12th, 1969, and uh, it's a lot of story, but the, the bit where during that afternoon, 
they had trapped some of the uh, survivors of the North Vietnamese about a thousand meters to the uh, northeast of our base mm -hmm. across the rice paddies. And after lunch chow, I had gone over to the LZ and I'm looking at the Huey gunship that's there. And all of a sudden, I'm watching this Phantom F4 bombing on its fourth bomb run, it got shot down. Or it got knocked down by its own bl bomb blast, I'm not sure, because it was mm -hmm. dropping the bombs from about 150 feet up. In any case, he got the NVA 50 cal machine gun, 51 cal machine gun that had been shooting at him with either his last bomb or with his plane, I don't know which, but they ejected at that point. So the Huey gets word of it over the radio. The short, a uh, gunner, a uh, machine gunner on the si uh, si side gunner, and I offered to go, and they say, okay, we gotta have somebody out there. So I got on the thing, and as they're start, they got the warming it up, they're starting to lift, here comes the other machine gunner, and they made me get off. So I almost got to go out as a door gunner on a Huey, which would have been an accomplishment. I also would have had a hard time explaining to where the hell I disappeared to. Uh, I would have had a, you know, where the hell are you? You're supposed to be standing to watch that next, I was supposed to be standing to watch that night, and I wouldn't have been back. They would have figured that out, and they would have excused me, but it would have been, where the hell were you? I would have had to bring a note for teachers, what I would have had to do. <laughs> So were you relieved to leave Vietnam? Yes and no. Um, Captain, asked Captain Queen, who was my last CEO, was an absolute hero type guy, great under fire leadership, well liked by his guys, asked me to stay as prerequisite. And I'm there like, okay, I've been waiting to go home. My time in the Marine Corps is up. I'd have to extend in the Marine Corps to stay in Vietnam. And I'm thinking, all I could think of is at that point was, is, is how long was Captain Queen going to stay? I'm thinking if he leaves and I get another one like Captain Blasey, I'm lost. And I, I thought about it until I drove him nuts. And then I finally, because he started pressing me, I said, no, I'll, I'll go home. But I, sh I should have stayed. I, I, I was not having a, a bad time of it. Uh, mm -hmm. And... Um, because I didn't spend much time playing forward observer, I didn't get a shot as much as, I didn't get shot at all that much compared to the infantry, the grunts. Mm -hmm. I would have been a lot more danger if I had been out with the infantry, than, but I never did walk with them. I only went on two foot patrols. One was with, with the, the uh, artillery guys looking for the MIA, and the other one was uh, we recovered two W two wounded two wounded uh, outside Liberty Bridge, and that was all a mishmash of volunteer stragglers, whatever you want, transients. I, mm -hmm. They weren't stragglers, but transients. We went out and recovered two wounded guys. We didn't get shot at. Okay. Now, now, when did you leave country? 11 June '69, about four o'clock in the afternoon. And here's one of my more fantastic tales. I flew out on the <coughs> propeller of a C-130. You've met somebody who was flown, actually flown, on the propeller of a plane. It was in the, it was in the cargo bay of the C-130. It was being sent back to Okinawa for repair, but I actually sat on a propeller. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Now, whereabouts did you land in the States? Uh, Norton Air Force Base, um, coming down, we come down, I, I suppose I'm flying about 20,000 feet or something in there, well it was heavily overcast, and we're dropping through the clouds, we're dropping through the clouds, dropping through the clouds, then I see on either side a little break, and on both sides of us is this great big huge rock mountains, one on each side off both wings. And I said, we're in a valley. And I said, because oh, you couldn't see anything. It's just solid cloud, except for that one little break for a second, I could see mountain. So dropping, dropping, dropping. And I'm getting nervous now because I think we've dropped the 20,000 feet. Finally, all of a sudden, we break free of the clouds. And we're about 20, 25 feet off the ground. Our wheels must be almost touching. Mm -hmm. 
Underneath our wheels, I can see pebbles. We're flying over a cornfield. Our, we were coming down short of the runway. The guy hit the gas, and we did a little hop like this. And as we hopped up like this, I saw a cyclone fence. It looked like a six-foot cyclone fence. We must have just cleared that fence, I don't know, feet, inches. We couldn't have been too damn high over that fence. So we just went hop and landed at, at Norton. Uh, and whereabouts was Norton? I don't really know. Out in the mountains someplace. Okay. All I know is it was mountainous. They took us by bus to uh, El Toro, which is toward Los Angeles. It's in, in the in, inland area of there. And he took us by bus, and then we just, all of a sudden, somebody on the one side of the bus, on the other side of the bus, says, hey, there's one of those cars. We were all admiring the new cars we had never seen. Mm -hmm. There's round eyes. Next thing you know, there's like the whole bus just hit that side, that right side of the bus, and it must have shook the driver. All staring, look, there's one of those cars, just I hadn't seen them. But uh, then we got to El Toro, and I spent a, I spent a week there getting discharged. Um, drunk. Um, they made me, uh, I, I must have got four haircuts in my last two weeks in the Marines, including the day of discharge. They made you do it, huh? The day I, went, the day I was getting out, they made me go get a haircut. I had gotten a haircut they, in Okinawa. I would gotten a, hair, a haircut in, 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 uh, in El Toro when I got there. There were, I think there were four haircuts in the 12 days. Hmm. I got out 23 June, 69, uh, six days before my two-year hitch would have been up, uh, which would have been 29 June, 69. And then you headed, headed back home? And as soon as I got on board that plane and we started flying after we got off the ground, I changed into civvies. The stewardess kind of blinked because she knew I was supposed to be in uniform to get on the plane. Uh -huh. And she's going, okay, but he's on the plane now. What do I do? Do I, you know, I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wasn't supposed to be doing that. Uh, but uh, she I, I know she kind of did the double take when she seen me in cities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, once you got out, you, you mentioned you went back to school and got your degree. Yeah, I went... I went back to school, school in the fall, fall of 69 at Westchester Community, and I got two associate degrees, uh, both majors, not minor, mm -hmm. in, uh, in a social science and, um, and in uh, math and science. I was the AS. And I had enough credits for a major in both of them. Um, after two years, I went, trip, I went up to Rockport State and got a earth science bachelor of science degree. Uh, graduated, uh, I we, we got I got married and uh, after graduation and uh, I went to school nights for computer science. I got 21 hours, not enough for a minor, but then I got a state job and I came to work for the state of New York. Now, did you? Uh Stay in touch with any any of the guys you were in the service with? Not much. Um, my best buddy over there was a guy named Sam Morgison. He had a drug and alcohol problem. Uh, he spent about four years in Vietnam. Uh, as far as I know, he never rose above the rank of PFC, and because he was getting himself into trouble, he. Uh, died in a car crash, DWI, mm. several years after Vietnam. The story I heard was is that when they were sending Marines home and they were looking for guys to stay or go home, they went to him, they called him in, they asked him why he had stayed there. And he says, stayed there for four years. He said, I like it here. They sent him home. Mm. <laughs> Probably yeah. the worst thing they could have done for him. Now, did you uh, attend any reunions at all? Now, um, I, I've been very unable to find guys that I knew. Mm -hmm. 
um, or was close friends with. Uh, I did find one guy from my boot camp platoon. Um, he helped me with uh, a claim, uh, a non compensatory claim. Uh, he was living on Long Island. I lost track of him. Uh, I talked to the guy, Brian Fullerton, who had been in boot camp with me in basic infantry uh, several years ago. Uh, but we were, uh, we, we were friendly, or I wasn't close friends with him either. Mm -hmm. um, couldn't find a, a buddy from, uh, I tried desperately to find the captain from, uh, from headquarters 213, have never found him. Uh, the, the, um, I found Clifford Blasey. Clifford Blasey. Didn't bother to contact him. <laughs> <laughs> Did you uh, join any uh, veterans organizations like the VFW or no, the Legion? No, I joined the 1st Marine Division Association. I knew Captain Pendus here, who, who was here uh, living in uh, out in Colony uh, until he died uh, this oh, yes. past year. Yep. Uh, but. Uh, no, I, it's been really hard. In fact, the matter is, is I've helped find a lot of other people for other people, mm -hmm. but I, I went and got unit red rosters for my units. I couldn't find them. Uh, I spent years looking for uh, the two WIAs that we WIAs that we helped at Liberty Bridge. I never identified their unit or who they were. I did come to the conclusion after years of research that the staff sergeant had lived but I couldn't find out who he was. Hmm. Uh, I thought he died, and then by my research indicated that he lived, which would have been nice to meet up with the guy. Um, I could have got accommodation for that, but I didn't. Uh, I wish I would taken the accommodation because then I would have known what happened to this guy. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know who he was. I don't know who the, uh, the enlisted guy was either. But, uh, but, um, I did find a guy that I mentioned a battle in Charlie 111. Uh, there was a guy named Paul Meyer, Corporal Paul Meyer, he later became staff sergeant after the war. He, uh, I did find him down in Florida. He was up in the tower the night of the battle and uh, I had, I, 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 I went over to check on him to see how he was. I said, hey Meyer, how you doing up there? You still alive? Well, you talk about glad to see me. Mark, who was not good friends with me, uh, we had had quite a few words, started telling me I had to come up there, and I'm laughing at him. And then he says that, uh, but they need you to call an artillery mission. They're asking for an artillery mission, and he's not qualified. He was fire control. He could work the telescope, but he couldn't direct artillery fire. Mm -hmm. So I... Not too happy about going up the tower. I went up the tower. It took me two tries to get up. Uh, I got shot at going up, going up the tower. I got shot at while I was on the tower. I got shot at in the morning. Um, Myrick, he only he could remember was that some guy came up and relieved him. He couldn't remember who the guy was. He doesn't remember me at all. Jeez. But I went up that tower, man. That was that was that was. It was duty, it was not metal time. Mm -hmm. This was something that you're being ordered to do. You had to go do it. It wasn't a choice, it wasn't free will of any kind mm -hmm. whatsoever. But I tell you, it, uh, I would have liked to have stayed on the ground rather than climb that ladder. Um, okay. How do you. Go ahead. Four days before I left, I was off watch. We had moved for the last week. I'm up in a tower, and this tower, instead of sitting on the roof, we had a telescope inside the, the box. And I was off watch and asleep on a, on, a, on a cot there, on a canvas cot. Another guy was sitting over on my, on, on the front of the thing, was sitting on a, like a bar stool, and he's the guy's on watch. Well, the next thing I know, I'm asleep, Somebody sprayed the tower from the from the north side, from the back side of the tower, sprayed the tower. I got hit with splinters of wood on my wrist while they were like this. Bullet deflected after it hit a two by four, deflected down into the floor between the two of us. 
If it hadn't deflected, it would have hit him on the fly, right? Mm -hmm. But it deflected into the floor. Uh, the last person to shoot at me in Vietnam was the South Vietnamese Arvin. He shot it up. He shot up a tower. I don't. We don't know why. They wouldn't let me call an artillery mission on the Arvin base. Mm. I tried, but the last person to take a shot at me was my father-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> How do you think your time in the service changed or affected your life? Uh, not enough. I, I think I should have stayed longer. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's been with me from the begin from from June 30th, 1967, till today. It's you never leave it. Mm -hmm. You don't leave it. Uh, you know, some years ago when this stuff started with started with the terrorism and stuff, um, I would have gone back in it. Except that I don't think they would have taken at that time a 55 year old uh, Lance Corporal out of shape and everything else. I would have gone back in. I want I. I I would have liked it. Mm -hmm. I would have liked it, but they, they have no use for a 55-year-old Lance Corporal. Um, everybody, when they uh, blew up the barracks in in Beirut, mm -hmm. I was living. Nobody else seemed to notice. When they uh, set off the bomb the first time in the World Trade Center, I was living. Nobody else seemed to notice. They hit that ship in the. Uh, Persian Gulf, blew a hole in the side of it. I'm up in arms, nobody seemed to notice. When finally they hit the Twin Towers with the airplanes, you know, I just kind of shrugged it off because I'm saying to myself, you know, nobody cares. But the, what really surprised me was the reaction to it. Mm -hmm. At that time, I'd gotten kind of callous to the lack of reaction. One other thing after I came home. Oops. Okay, go ahead. One other thing, when I came home, I was kind of astounded by people. Uh, people were asking me questions, you know, like, did I bayonet any babies? Mm -hmm. Did I uh, burn any villages? And I was like, what the hell are they talking about? Um, the, the amount of people that were rooting for the other side, I just couldn't believe what I was coming up with. The, uh, there's an old movie called uh, Little Shop of Horrors, and they show a post office box, mailbox outside, uh, the old uh, blue and red top mailbox. And it brought back a very painful mo a memory when I seen that on television years later, because when I came home, people were painting yellow stars between the red and blue on the mailboxes, they were making them look like Viet Cong flags. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, in my hometown of Marinick, I was unbelievable. I mean, it was perfectly clear to me who the bad guys were. Um, there were mistakes. Civilians got killed accidentally over there by us. I saw it happen. I was a witness more than, more than once. But they were always accidents. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, the 155 shell that nearly blew me off the top of a mountain. Um, but the, uh, the one time I saw it out and out murder, it was committed by two Viet Cong against two old men, about a half dozen women, and the rest were infants or toddlers. There were 14 of them that were killed. One infant survived. They had set up a 250-pound bomb when they uh, detonated it by wire, and they knocked out a, a laundry truck that worked on the base that I was stationed at at that time. I was coming back south toward the hill, and they were leaving, and they got blown up. I could feel the, the blast in my face. Mm -hmm. The What part of it was is that they had deliberately targeted that, that, that laundry truck because they did our laundry. I knew those civilians, I used to talk with them in Vietnamese, the barbers used to cut my hair, I knew those people and they, they butchered them right in front of me. Jeez. They, uh, it looked like a soda can tossed in a fire for a while and then chopped with an axe. Just shreds. The one infant had been on top of a stack of laundry 
and uh, it was just screaming and screaming. And uh, the guys there that had been close enough asked me what to do, and I said, take it up to the regiment there, First Marine Regiment uh, headquarters, and what are you going to do with an infant? I figured from there it would go to Da Nang. I didn't, mm -hmm. didn't, you know, what were we going to do with an infant? I continued on. I was driving on a PC back toward my base after I passed the truck, and I came upon a fire team of four Marines from 1st Marine Regiment, which was right, right near their, their battalion and regiment CP. And they had two Viet Cong with them, two young kids. They had caught them, seen them running away, seen them, they ran into the, the fire team. So they took them back to where they saw them run from and they found the wire and the detonating thing, the battery thing, they had set off the, the thing. So they now had the two VC. Well, one of the VC was not taken too well with being taken prisoner. He was yelling at him, shoving back. They're trying to get him to walk, and he's arguing with him. Well, they were so pissed. They knew that that about the fourteen dead civilians, and they and they were pissed as hell at these guys. So this one squad uh, fire team leader just stepped back and shot the guy right in the head. Any other time, I would have said something about it, but knowing that what they, these two guys had done to those 14 civilians, I did not report it. I would have reported it. It, it was the only time I saw anything like that. To me, that wasn't murder, it was justice. Somebody suggested to me long afterwards, the reason they killed these 14 civilians was they wanted to replace them, hopefully to get one of their own people on, a VC person on that base, that these, four, that these well, actually, you're talking two old men and maybe a half dozen women mm. were working the, uh, the barbers and the, and the laundry, that they wanted to try to get a spy in the base, and one way to do it was clear everybody off that base, that they couldn't get those to convert, maybe somebody else would. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they did replace those, those people with another, another group. Mm. Okay. Um... Any, any final thoughts uh, before we close? Was there anything else you wanted to show us? Any, any uh, photographs? Uh, you had the one of me by the Cannon Flower Power. Yep. Uh, this, I don't know if you want to turn that off for a while. Or maybe you want to look through this stuff. I, I, looked, I looked at those photos. They're going to be a little hard to uh, get on film. I don't know that you want to or, or, or not. There may be something in particular, but I thought maybe if you want to look through them, I'll run out. Yeah, here's a photo you'll like. Okay, uh, hold, hold that whole thing up in front of you. Uh, is that I can zoom in on? <laughs> um, is that you? Yeah. Yeah, but... Um, I was thinking that if you wanted to poke through these while I ran out to the car. Okay, let's bring, bring that back towards you, if you would. Then I can't see what's it. going on out there. My finger's holding it properly. Yeah, I'm, I'm having difficulty zooming in it. I can see where I'm holding it. Let's do, okay, okay. okay. It. Huh? I, right there is good. I, I, I got that. You, you got a beard, I see, and. And the, the picture opposite is the tower you were in? Uh, yeah, that's O.P. Parrot. Okay. Polly wanted a cracker. What? Okay, now, how, how did you get away with having a beard over there? You wanted to push for a while and don't shave. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, it looks neatly trimmed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you it didn't stay there very long. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> It didn't stay here very long. Uh, I've seen guys who were worse than that. Uh, uh, I, I made a couple trips out to Laos by Chopper, uh, where we had the two 155 Toads that had been with us for a while. This was a Lima battery, 411, the 155 as self-propelled. Mm -hmm. And we had two guns that were temporarily assigned to us. They spent three months out in the mountains. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for your interview. Yeah.